discuss uh, in this lecture um, the process of some aspects of the process of nation building in Central <coughs> and Eastern Europe. And today, uh, in this lecture, uh, I will focus on certain aspects of uh, how this happened in the, the Polish case, the Czech, the Czech case, and the Hungarian case. <coughs> And in the, in the second lecture, uh, I will focus on some of the other peoples, Romanian, uh, Croats, Slovenes, Lesla Slovenes, Serbians, and so on. Uh, <coughs> uh, so, so let's look at certain aspects that you um, should pay attention to uh, in order to understand how these countries that we talk about have, have come about. Today, right? We have something called the Czech Republic today. Did it ever exist in history before 1918? Actually, before 1993? No, never. Never in history did the Czech Republic exist before 1993. Czechoslovakia, which was a, 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 a country, of, a state of Czechs and Slovaks, only came about after 1918. And you see, this is the canonical. This is the difficulty which you are facing. The challenge that you are facing, trying to. Uh, you know, because you're reading a book that is, uh, as has chapters, as I said, that are called <coughs> po Poland, Czech Republic, this and this and this. As if, you know, throughout history these have been a reality. Or as if history must have led to this uh, conclusion. Everything had to go to the Czech Republic. Kind of end there. Well, why? If you would write the same history uh, 30 years ago, then you would write the history of the Czechoslovakia, because that was the state that existed. Or if you write, if, if you wrote it um, 150 years ago, maybe you would write the history of the Habsburg Empire. This is the problem with history writing, because history writing is, you know, we, we always try to write the story of something, as if that something has continued throughout history. That's the problem of nationalism. And that's a problem of history because history, modern history writing was invented in the 19th century. Hence many of the, as I mentioned in the previous lecture, many of the uh, historians, you read history in the 19th century, French historians, uh, Michelet and others, uh, you will see that they write, you know, again, read, interpret the events of the past as the events of the present, as the events of leading to the present, but also the events that uh, belong to the, to the entity that is present only today. For example, I read the, the stories about the Gauls, Gallic tribes, as, 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 as part of history of France. Well, of course, France did, did not exist at that point. The very notion of Frenchness didn't exist, which was formed in history centuries later. So how is that the history of this? Right? That's the problem. And I find uh, it, it's normal to have challenges because uh, it's easy to, 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 to be uh, challenged by this, right? but this is why I'm emphasizing, this is why I'm underlining um, that uh, this is a problem. And this is why you try to read this history as the, the people who lived then, what would they have called themselves? How would they have discussed their present? Well, definitely not as Czechs or, you know, as Slovaks or whatever, say in the Middle Ages, right? They were Bohemians. Or if you counted, you were noble, and so on and so on. Right? And that's the conundrum. But, as discussed in the previous um, lecture, the 18th, 19th century, the 19th century is the era where the modern state is formed, and also when nationhood becomes defined because of the modern state. Because the modern state is an overarching state, that changes its relationship with, with, the, with the people who live in its territory so much so that now every individual becomes a citizen and thus a member in this state suddenly you have to define this membership based on certain criteria who will become a member, who won't become a member? does anyone who come in across the borders become automatically a member? well obviously not otherwise there wouldn't be all these discussions about illegal immigration in the United States for example today why do we worry about that? Let's just come in and give them citizenship on the Whoever crosses the border is a citizen. That sounds strange, right? But why not? Right? The, 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 the why not is because we have this idea that any a set of political institutions governs 
a state governs a territory, but also governs a specific people. But what are the criteria by which we define who is in and who is out? Based on what? Right? What, you know, what is the limit? Why and here and not there? The accident of birth on a territory, should that, I mean, just because it happens that you were born flying over the territory, that should be it. I mean, what is, what is it that makes you a member of it or, or not a member of it? But you see, this conundrum could never come about before modernity, before the invention of modern egalitarian citizenship, before the invention of the modern state that has a set of institutions, the bureaucracy, that reaches out to each individual and grabs him. There is no interposed barrier between this powerful state and the individual citizen. There's no longer a guilt, there's no longer your inherited privilege as a noble family, there's no longer your inherited rights as a city of Hamburg, right? Nothing stands in, in between you and the state. This is why today's state can take you and throw you into a hole and throw away the key. If it decides so. If it decides so. Right? Which is, you know, the, this is why totalitarian states are possible. States that attempt to govern every aspect of your life, including what you think. This would never have been possible in history. Because there, there weren't the tools, the microphones to bug the, 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 the apartments, the, the spy network to, to, to control your whole life, the surveillance cameras. Right? All of this now is possible, and it's in the hands of the state. Right? That's the modern state. Okay. So, many things conspire then to, to create, to, 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 to notice that how, and notice how uh, the idea of progress, right? of, 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 you know, of, uh, you know, of modernization, of efficiency, is intrinsically linked with the idea of nation building. This is why state building and nation building are parallel. But remember that they're not the same thing, state and nation, we define them. And please use these concepts distinctly because they mean something completely different. Right? We discussed this in the, in the previous lecture. These are two different concepts, two different words, mean two different meanings, right? Uh, but the processes are going parallel. Because this is the time when the, so the idea uh, came, comes about that a nation, a people needs to govern itself. But who is that people that governs itself? Think of the United States of America. Who are the people who govern themselves? The Americans. False, right? Who were the Americans, right? Who, who asked to govern themselves? Was it people who lived in on the continent? No. The Native Americans were not. Africans, uh, Americans, uh, blacks were not. Uh, the French, the Spanish, the Spanish who actually control claimed most of the continent were not at the time of the Declaration of Independence. So who are these? You know, even in clearly it was not everybody. Right? You always define based on certain criteria who is in and who is out. Well let's look at the situation then for our for these lands that we have studied. What is their situation at this time? At let's say 1800? Because at the beginning of this process. Well, one thing we see is that, uh, first of all, basically all of them lack a key element in this process of state building and nation building. Statehood. Most of all of these, or most of these, have lost statehood. Poland has disappeared. It just suffered the three partitions. The Czech lands are part of direct rule from Vienna. The Czech lands, Bohemia. There was no Czech lands. There was a, the notion of Czech is invented now. Understand that. Bohemia had a history. Czech didn't have a history. This is why they write history to say the history of the Czechs. But they have to invent it. They have to say this is all Czech. Again, the Hungarians, or what we call Hungarians, Hungarian speakers, live part of the do not have a state after having that in the Middle Ages. And basically every single one of them, forget about Romanians, who never had one state. But why would they, right? So that's a common trait. And that will shape, as I said, the fact that in Central Eastern Europe, even those peoples, or those groups of people, 
who normally would expect to have a nation building process, to define their nation just like they have done throughout history based on political criteria. I'm talking about the Polish nation, which was what? The nobles. Who cares what ethnic origin you had? The Hungarian nation, which was what? The nobles. Again, John Hunyon, who knows his mother was originally spoke some Romanian stuff. So that wasn't the point. Peasants spoke those languages. If you were cultivated, you spoke the language of the court, Latin. So you would expect these states, which have had statehood, to define themselves just like France. Remember, because, you know, for centuries, you looked at the maps and you saw what? France, Poland, Hungary. France, Poland, Hungary. France, Poland, Hungary. As huge entities. If, perhaps, that in the 19th century they would have been in the same, the map would have looked the same, self-definition would have been the same in these lands. The same as in France. Where it was, well, whoever is within the borders becomes French. But remember, this wasn't a nice thing, though. Because then the, those who were within the border, whether or not they wanted it, they had to learn this dialect of French, which was the cultivated French. Just like the Germans, uh, or the Polish from Milwaukee, at the beginning of the 20th century, basically, they had to stop publishing newspapers in their own language, and stop using their own language, and having schools in their own language, and so on, and assimilate. That happened in France in the 19th century. You have to speak the language of the, of the state. Why? Why not have 25,000 languages? Well, what do you do without a national language? Why? When in history did you have to have a national language? You had the language of politics, of the court, which was Latin, which was the language of none of these. It was an ancient language. Classical language, Latin. That was the lingua, you know, that was the common language for all of Europe in terms of the cultivated ones, art, uh, you know, church, uh, court, politics, and so on. Documents were readable by all, because they were only Latin. So why not have, have that, and have each peasant, each region speak its own dialect, as it has been throughout history? No. This new set of institutions demands and imposes that everybody speaks the same language. And why do they do that? Because this new, uh, 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 this new state, centralized government, has the institutions that cover the entire territory, administers the territory through all-encompassing institutions, with which, with which from now on you will have to deal. Until now you didn't have to deal with the central government, you dealt with the noble, with the, your city government, you with whatever, your bishop, your whatever. But now you have to deal with this one centralized government, and guess what, in order to, to have, make this possible, they need to use one language, so that these documents can be, you know, you have to uh, fill a form, you have to fill it in the language that the system understands. And this government in France, for example, will take control of public education, of the military, universal conscription. One set of institutions with one, uh, uh, all encompassing the whole territory with one center, right? One center, all of this needs to be coherent and understandable, translatable. So everyone needs to speak the same language in administration, and in order to deal with them, you have to learn that language. Hey, this is here, there's general education uh, provided by the government, that's good, that will help me integrate, function in this new centralized modern state. Right? Uh, try to, you know, uh, well, anyway. <laughs> so that's what actually happens in the Austrian monarchy, in the Habsburg monarchy, right? Because we read about that. The enlightened monarchs, reforms, legal equality. Through what? Through a centralized bureaucracy. And this is why these enlightened monarchs, like Maria Theresia, uh, or, 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 or even more so Joseph, who followed her, they also impose the German language as the language that everybody needs to use on all the provinces. And that's when problems occur. Because there's this process of forced Germanization, forced unification, right? Which is needed for the modern state. And then the, the, the peoples from these 
lands were actually, for example, in Hungary, the nobles and, and the cultivated people spoke Latin and German, not Hungarian. Some of these, you know, leaders of Hungarian national movement didn't even speak Hungarian. But, but this forced process of, 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 of uh, you know, will have its effects, its negative effects. It will lead to the discovery of the Czech language. Discovery, I mean, and discovery of Czech history. And by discovery, I mean writing a story, and this only happens in the 19th century, which says, uh oh, no, no, there's such a thing as Czechs that have existed through history, or Slavs at least, and there's a history that is one. It's written first in the 19th century. Backwards. Right? Just like today we write the history of, the, of, of, of you know, American history, where do we start? Do we start with the Declaration of Independence when the um, United States of America is actually formed, or do you go to the colonies? Well, what made them American? Because they were English. Again, it's reading history backwards. So that's the, that's the situation. So these, these entities that you would expect to, to build their nation, like the French, cannot because they simply don't have that statehood right now when this happens. If they would have had, they would have developed different. So they're left, so what you will have in the 19th century, in, especially in Central Europe, you'll have this dual conflict, both of the Pol 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 Polish, the Czechs, and the Hungarians, which define themselves now, clearly, in the sense of mass identity, not political identity, which was always clear that there were Polish, you know. Um, define themselves in on two, two competing tracks. You will, you will see both the political definition of nationhood that we talked about, right? Nation is being defined politically, which means based on either political values or on just belonging to a political structure, which is the American model, isn't it? Although it has a strong cultural dimension, right? Because you have to speak English, actually, to function in administration and so on. And, or ethnoculture. And you see both these strains were straining at each other. Conflicting, competing, being simultaneous. Because one was, who, is, who are the Poles? Where it, there is was a Poland, that's, that's who the Poles are, that nation of nobles in the recent past that has disappeared, we want it back. But then there's also this, the Polish are those who speak Polish. It's more than just the nobles, it's the masses. And by the way, and, and those who are Catholic, and those who are, have these folk traditions, and these are the Polish. Or who are the Germans, I told you. In the case of the Germans, this was the thing. They didn't have state, but they never had state. Germany never existed. Italy never existed in history. In history until 1871. There was an Italian peninsula, but just like that, there's a Europe. And they spoke very different dialects. I gave you the example of Spain, which, you know, even today, I mean, the Catalans, the Basques speak something far away from Spanish, and they don't consider themselves part of Spain, but they have to be there because they're forced, basically. Because they define themselves as no country. So let's look at certain uh, uh, examples here. So the Pole, who are the Poles, right, in the 18th century? A nation of nobles, as we talked about. Who had a, a, a state, that, actually a commonwealth. It wasn't even a Polish state, was it? Was it? it was a commonwealth of Polish Lithuania. Um, and then suffers the three famous partitions of Poland. 1772, 1793, 1794, uh, 1795, through which, or during which, Poland, the state that has existed throughout the Middle Ages, disappears. Because it's faced by three competing empires, Prussian, Russian, and Austrian. And there's the first partition, the second partition, and the third partition in the materials that I have posted uh, just today. So by 1850, you look at the map of Europe, and there's a larger version that I linked there. And you look at the map of Europe, and you will see, well, where is Poland? There is no Poland. There is no Poland. So, this is clearly, you know, obviously lived as a tragedy. And there is no Poland, actually, it's a name here, but it's part of Russia, as we see. Um, it's shows you lands, right? Um, it's, a, it's, it's a historical tragedy of, of uh, you know, Polish consciousness. And it 
stimulates the growth of national identity. Because the nation is gone, right? The, the, the state is gone, what you will be left with is with an attempt to, you know, maintain identity through what? When the state is gone, what will remain? Well, first of all, note that Poland, the state, was divided between Prussia, Russia, and Austria. And these were very different states with very different cultures, with very different systems of government and, you know, uh, uh, traditions uh, of, of rule and so on. Prussia was mostly a Protestant state, very militaristic, very centralized, very bureaucratic. Russia was a, you know, obviously led from Moscow, the Russian Empire, it was the Russian, Russian Empire, right? Uh, it was an empire of country many, uh, expanding over many other lands, but uh, which was with the dominant, you know, uh, Eastern Orthodox, right, uh, culture, uh, a tradition of rule that was, had nothing to do with, you know, uh, rights and, and liberties and so on, it was authoritarian, and so on, and then there's the, there was Austria or the Austrian, Austrian Empire, which was a multicultural, you know, sort of an empire, which was had a tradition of more, you know, relaxed uh, relationship with the lands uh, that composed it, uh, and so on. And it was mostly Catholic, but it had lots of Protestants as well. And po you know, the the, 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 Asian, the Polish state finds itself part of all this thing, and the Polish people will will have who will you know will be faced with different fates in each of these territories. In Prussia, they will be the subject of war, meaning the famous cultural war. The term cultural wars, that might sound familiar for you, comes from that. Because Bismarck, the ruler of Prussia, was fought, uh, it was he promoted, and this is what it was called, Kulturkampf, cultural war, because it was war against the culture. It was war against the Catholic Church, which was the backbone of Polish identity, because in this Protestant lands, this is what around we, where they could gather the the, 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 the backbone of of that remaining society. Just like you know, remember when the Ottoman Empire, the, the Orthodox Church was the backbone or the only institutional structure around which Serbian identity could maintain itself. Same with the, for the Bulgarians. Now that's what happens in Prussia, Kulturkampf. So oppression in Russia, it was a different sort of oppression. And you know, there, was, there were times when it was better, it was worse, but because it was an authoritarian rule in Russia, like in Austria, for example, uh, it was different, <coughs> in, in Russia you would have persecution, again, because they were different, they were Catholic, those were Orthodox. This is when, remember the Uniate Church, meaning that the Church that resulted from the Union of the Orthodox joining the Catholic Church in the Union of Brest-Litovsk, so, so called Greek Catholic Church, right? Or Union's church, right? Uh, that was formed right in the Polish territories, uh, but or the Orthodox, the other Orthodox, the rest of the Orthodox always perceived this as a treason. And these Orthodox churches joining Rome, joining joining uh, the Catholic Church, uh, which again and again and again had nothing to do back then with the Holy Roman Empire, which is something completely different. So um, now, when in these now Russian controlled parts of former Poland, this Greek Catholic Church would be banned, abolished, by force, because they were traitors. Well, guess what? This is early, uh, late, 19, uh, 19, late 18th century, early 19th century. The same thing would happen 150 years ago during communism, in the same lands, Soviet Union, uh, Romania, and so on, but it's where there's a majority of Orthodox Church, they will ban the Greek Catholic Church. History uh, repeats itself. So, Poland, and then there's a third part which was part of, of Austria, uh, of the Austrian Empire. And this part actually fared the best. Not at first, when it was more backward, it was a kind of a remote province, Galicia. But it, then it became the hotbed of Polish culture, because this was the most relaxed environment. In fact, the Polish governed themselves in Galicia, in this part of, um, in this part of the Austrian Empire. They govern themselves, which also meant that the other populations there, the Ruthenians or the Ukrainians, actually had the, you know, uh, actually were su uh, suffered basically from Polish rule. So that's an interesting, you know, conundrum always, because the Polish were the oppressed victims, but you know, in Galicia specifically, they were also, you know, the 
the, 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 the group that had the upper hand over the rest of the populations. So, that's an interesting, uh, you know, it, you'll see it in other cases like the Hungarians versus the Austrians versus, uh, uh, and Hungarians versus Romanians and Slovaks and so on. Right? And on. Or think of, you know, again, the creation of independence. We hold that all, all men are equal, but not the slaves, but not the Native Americans, but they're not part of it. When you go towards, when you look towards the oppressor, you're the victim, but other people are victim towards you. It's always like that. You always define who's in and who's out. In any way, uh, so, so for the Polish, how did they maintain the Polish identity, right? Again, as I said, there was... Um, there were several uh, uh, trends uh, uh, going on. There were several trends going on, and it depends where, right? Because in each of these places, you had armed insurrections. Actually, less in Austria, but against Prussia here and against the Russians here, they all failed. They also failed because of division among the among the poles. Uh, but a, a common a common trait uh, was uh, what were the common traits around which the Polish maintained themselves, right? And the famous, the famous phrase uh, during this time, right, uh, when, when Poland was after the third uh, uh, partition of Poland, um, was Poland is not yet lost as long as we live. This will actually become the national anthem. It's an interesting, you know, story or an interesting aspect that you should pay attention to, that most of the national anthems of these, the states that today populate, you know, Central Eastern Europe, were written in that time. Why? Because that's the, when, when, the, when the nationhood was defined. This is when people wrote songs about nationhood. It's just like, you know, Star Spangled Banner. Banner, it, it, it reflects a moment of the definition of nation versus advers adversary uh, uh, forces, right? Uh, battle at Baltimore and so on, so the, you know, and this is when modern flags basically are invented, by the way. It's the same time. It's the same time. The flags didn't exist. Before, as, as we understand them today, because flags are, are, are supposed to represent a nation. Well, nations didn't exist before modernity as we understand them today. Right? As we understand them today, it's strictly associated with the state and so on. So the flag of a state is also the flag of, uh, the flag of, a, of a nation. So other aspects of, 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 of Polish self definition so what were the things that they had? They had the memory of statehood, and that was, that was important. Uh, they had the nobility. In many places, they, they, the nobility uh, remained and, and kind of harkened back to that reality of the nobility being uh, the nation. Um, there was, of course, um, it helped that they had common adversaries, common enemies. It, you know, there's nothing that unites you more than when you're under attack. And this was true, especially again in Prussia and in Russia and last in Austria. That's in Austria, where they actually had the upper hand. But even there, you were united by oppressing other groups, basically, right? Um, uh, then, an interesting aspect of, of Polish, or not just Polish, Czech uh, national, uh, you know, uh, building, is the role of the diaspora. Namely, those groups of Poles or Czechs or whatever, Bohemians, basically, because Czechs didn't exist, who went abroad, who lived abroad. And for the Poles, this would become a, a constant thing in, in modern history, and most, more, more, many of them will go to either England or, or France and they will recruit uh, and, and, and organize militarily there and this will also happen in World War II, uh, 100 years later or 150 years later that you will have divisions of Polish divisions in, you know, in England fighting and coming back and liberating Europe it's very, you know. so there's a tradition of diaspora What's the, problem with the, the deal with the diaspora is that people who leave their country or, or uh, part of origin become much more nationalistic uh, because they look back at something lost, something that was great with much more rosier picture than those who stay. And that's even today is the case. So you have diaspora lobbies in the United States around Congress that will be more, much more nationalistic and kind of narrow-minded than the people in the original country where they don't, don't go back but they kind of overly care about that. So the role of the diaspora. Um, it's very important that they manage to make institutions, different institutions, uh, co especially cultural institutions, but also some army institutions and political parties. And again, institutions are key, right? Institutions are key to, to creating uh, uh, identity or, or to even creating common action, right? 
without institutions, there is no common action. And the fact that they managed to uh, establish even political parties or cultural clubs or sort of militias or armed guards was very important when it came to action to claim statehood uh, and so on. Now, of course, at the heart of it, and more, probably the most you know, equally or even more important, is culture. Is culture. Because you needed to define what Polish was. And this is a time in all these countries, by the way, when you will have the so called national poets, national writers, who will write about the nation. But by writing about the nation, they define the nation. They invent it to a degree. Because what they write is usually about history. But they, they write about history reading it as the history of the Polish nation. And these are the famous names like Adam Mickiewicz, uh, right, for the Polish, who wrote Pan Tadeusz, who was kind of the national epic. But it's national epic because it actually goes and writes about the history of some Lithuanian, Polish Lithuanian nobles in the Middle Ages or whatever, but that becomes the history of the Poles today, right? Um, it's similar to the Germans who rediscovered the myths of the Nibelungen and whatever, right? And even Hitler later, you know, he will refer to German ancient myths and so on. What is that? You project into the distant past, past uh, a common origin. And events that 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 through which you will help everyone now feel like they belong to the same story or to the same history. Right? That's what these myths do. Right? You create common uh, stories of origin, okay? and these are very important. Who can do that? But you know, writers. You know. Um, so culture, language, history, the the, 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 the development of history. An aspect here of, of, uh, uh, regarding culture was, okay, you have language which needs to be defined and clarified and it was even harder here and here, so what it, what it happens is that national identity, ironically, will be more clearly, can flourish, and this culture can flourish where? In the place where they have the best situation, Galicia, in the Austrian Empire, actually, um, in that province, because this is where they could develop uh, culture. Here they were censored, they were under oppression from the Tsarist government in, 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 the, in the Russian Empire. Okay? So back to you know, language and identity, it's like, what is it to be Polish? Right? Again, because being Polish meant you were part of the political body, which were the nobles, right? Well, that's a very, that's a niche, right? That's a niche. But how come that all of these people, the peasants, the serfs, these people who never matter, how, are they Polish? What makes them Polish? And what does it mean to be Polish and not Czech and not and not Bohemian, not Moravian, not this, not that? I mean, there's no, you know, what is the set? Right? And this is where uh, the fact is complicated. But uh, I mean, complicated. It's even another layer to this is the fact that there is a common Slavic background, right? Just like you know, Italian, Spanish, you know, have a Latin background, French included, right? At least for the language. So there is this negotiation of what does it mean that we belong to this Slavic sort of a language of uh, nation, uh, group of languages, and is, is this an identity? Should we be Slavs instead of Poles? And, and, and you know, this is this is going on. Or what? How should we relate to other sort of Slavic people whose language well, is we can understand parts of it because it's, it's kind of close. And, you know, some are closer, some are more distant, right? Just like this Italian person they understands Spanish. Well, they're, they're, consider themselves different people and so on, or uh, and so on. Uh, or if you speak German and English, you understand some Danish, right? And still you consider them different, right? Or Swedish. Um, so, uh, so that the whole Slavic uh, thing also becomes uh, becomes an issue, but even more so in the case of the of the of the, of the Czechs. So, more information about this, I mean, the, the, the meat of the thing, you know, you have to get from fruit. But I, I'm giving you certain uh, common trends, certain common aspects. So, the Czechs, moving on to the Czechs, uh, here's, a, here's, you know, uh, here's, a, here's a conundrum. The Czechs were uh, part of, and remember, they have been associated with either the Holy Roman Empire, which was a, basically a federation of Germanic states, uh, Czechs were in Germany, but you know, not the Czechs, the, more, the Bohemians. That's what existed in history. Bohemians. Yeah, it doesn't mean that uh, Bohemians, people from Bohemia. That's what existed, and from Moravia. Czechs didn't exist. Okay. Like, there was no Czech identity, it was Bohemian. Okay. Um, 
But in the, it's in the beginning of the 19th century when this identity is discovered and promoted. But no, there isn't such a thing as a Czech identity. And the irony is that the first writers who write about this, uh, and historians, they will publish their books in... They, they write a book of the history of the Czechs, the first ever book written about this, because I just invented it, I, I just discovered it, in German. They themselves wrote in German. That was the cultivated language. And then, would have to translate it into Czech, which was developing then as a standardized language. Doesn't mean it didn't exist, but to standardize it, to make it the language, a language, a body of language, that takes effort. And it was never, it never needed. It was never a thing. You were cultivated, you spoke the language of the, you know, whatever was the language of politics. And Latin was a common, you know, uh, language, as I mentioned, and so on. So, and the reason why they do this is because of what I just said, because of the enlightened reforms of the Austrian Empire and emperors, which came with forced Germanization. Now, we talked about the fact that the situation of the Hungarian lands versus the Czech lands was different because in the Hungarian lands under the Habsburg Empire, the Hungarians kept self-rule in the sense that there was a parliament, a diet, and the emperor ran, uh, was separately, the, the monarch of Austria was separately king of Hungary. Remember the doctrine of the Holy Crown or whatever. He was given, he, you know, this person ruled Austria, then ruled Hungary separately. And ruled Hungary through the diet of the nobles, who maintained actually the authority in the country. We talked about this. Now, because of the direct rule of the Czech lands, remember the capital of, 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 of the empire sometimes was in Prague, advantage and disadvantage, uh, they were directly forced and subjected to this, uh, to this process of, you know, legal reform and educational reform and this and this, and forced Germanization. And this is when this comes to a head. And this is when you have these historians, uh, writers, um, who, who start writing a Czech history, or talking about a Czech history. So they reread the history of Bohemia, and know, there is a Czech thing. And then they go to the Hussite Wars, right, that we talked about, which was, you know, four, 500 years before. What do you know about 500 years before, right? It, that was the case then, right? Four or five hundred years before. And they go back and say, no, no, this is something that is actually about us today, about us. How could it be? Because they lived then. And what is the continuity? But that's the point. You write a history, you write a story that kind of connects something in the past, and says, oh no, there's a trajectory, and it leads to us, and that, then it becomes part of us. I was born a few decades ago, clearly I have nothing to do personally with anything that came before that. Right? But I start having something to do if I define myself, if I become part of a culture, of a narrative, that makes me part of something transitory, that unites, that links things across decades, across centuries. And then I become part of a, a thing that endures beyond my biological life. That's history writing. You know, that's history writing. It's a narrative that, that, that connects. Are they connected? So, the Czech language, it didn't really function or exist. It had to be defined. It had to be worked on. Um, but what's interesting in the, in the Czech lands is that you had different, uh, just like in the Polish uh, uh, and the Czech, uh, Hungarian cases, you have different competing, uh, you know, narratives and, and, and directions or tracks of trying to do this. You have the nobles, the Czech nobles, who were not interested in, uh, you, who were more interested in recovering the Czech statehood, or Bohemian, right, excuse me, Bohemian statehood, in this, what your book calls, Landes Patriotismus, which actually is politically defined nation. So, that's what I said, the politically defined nationalism, politically defined nation. Because how else, right, the nobles were members of the Bohemian state, were the Bohemian state based on their political belonging, not on whatever language your grandmother spoke. Or you speak at home, doesn't matter. And that was the case of the nobles in Poland, the nobles in Hungary. It was their belonging to the state that gave their identity. So the nobles in the Czech, they still recall and hearken back to that. And that goes against, of course, 
the, this rule by the Austrians, right? That is nationalism as well, right? That is patriotism as well, not the same, by the way, the two words, I'm going to find them later. But it's different then from cultural nationalism. Or it can be blended really, but it's different. Because it means you don't have to speak in this language from mother to son to grandmother to, to be truly part of the nation. You can just belong to the state. But, uh, however, the cultural nationalism becomes more powerful. And uh, here is, is, is worth uh, mentioning the role of the 1848 revolutions, which are, I, I posted the mapping on, on one of the previous documents. The revolutions of 1848, middle of century. These were the so-called spring, uh, you know, this was the springtime of nations, was called. Now, notice the strange expression, springtime of nations. What in the world can that mean? How can nations have springtime, and why is this the springtime of whom, right? And why the 1848 were the springtime of nations is that all these revolutions happened in basically, uh, well, in empires, in multinational empires. Right? Um, and second, in, in regimes that were not uh, democratic. None of them were. <laughs> but that's the point. The 1848 revolutions were liberal and national. And liberal, by this I mean the traditional liberal, right? Liberalism, no, it meant in the 19th century, which is, has nothing to do with what the United States is called liberalism. Liberalism meant the individual, right? Individualism and the rights of the individual, uh, uh, you know, and uh, th that was the, the core of it, you know. Political and civil rights to the individual, that's liberalism. And we live in a liberal world today, in that sense, right? Both, for example, America, those liberal parties are liberal parties. They both talk about the individual and his rights, only they apply to different issues. Right? So, uh, that's classical liberalism. We live in a world based on well, these were, 1848 were revolutions that were both liberal and national. And they were national because when you say the rights of the individuals and the rights of the peoples to govern themselves based on these rights of the individuals, you end up again and again and again to this idea of nation. Because you always have to ask, if the people should govern themselves, who are the people? Because here you have multinational empires, all of these should govern themselves here, or are there more particular entities? Well, by this time, the, as, you know, as a result of the, the, the processes that went just, you know, in the previous decades and the romanticism and this passion for the past and the recovery of the past, I mean, there has been all this going on. So now, by this point, nation, the people means nation and nation means language and culture and history and folk traditions. It's ethno-culture. So all those people who speak German are German, and uh, they all relate to the same history, and they all have the same ancestry, the way we think us today, which was not true, and is not true. And it would cause huge problems. Hitler will be driven by a similar thing, although he'll go farther into racism and so on. But what's the first act that Hitler did? To take over Austria. Austria. Well, Austria, why? Because he said they're German. Well, are they German? Well, actually, even in Austria, there is a fraction of 20% who even today would say we're German and others, the 80% would say, no, no, we're Austrian. Well, you speak German, no, no, we speak a German dialect, but we're Austrian. In Switzerland, there are many German speakers, but they're Swiss, and they've always been Swiss for 800 years, as long as Switzerland actually has existed. You know, it's just like saying, you're English because you speak English. Or Australian is English because he speaks English, and you're saying, I'm American. You see how language is, not, is, a tricky, is a tricky tool to define nationhood. Right? And that's part of the conundrum, right? And, for, and then you have to define it because there is no such thing as a language or just this many languages. There have always been dialects and variations, but when the modern states are formed, they will impose one standardized version. That's what happened in Italy and everywhere else. So in 1848, Revolutions are liberal because they go against, you know, this, these sort of more, authority, more powerful, you know, rulers, stronger, more authoritarian regimes. But by the way, one of some of these authoritarian regimes were the same who have introduced those enlightened reforms. So now you don't like them? Well, they exchange. So the liberal is goes both against the, the, the old type of regime, based on aristocracy, based on more, more top-down rule, 
and national. This is why it's springtime of nations in 1848. And Prague will be, you know, at the heart of it, and Hungary will be at the heart of it. Another, uh, so, you know, these national revolutions will happen in all these places. In all these places. And, and, and Prague will be, and your book talks about that. Um, another interesting issue about the Czechs, and because I mentioned the Slavs, is was, again, okay, there was a quest to define who, what is Czech identity? Because I have Bohemian history, but I have these people here in Moravia, and then there are these people who are always have lived in part of have been part of the Hungarian kingdom, speak some a Slavic dialect, very actually almost identical to ours, but they, they have developed a different sort of historical identity. They will be the Slovaks later. So who are the Czechs? Or should we just think of Slavs? Let's just unite all the Slavs. But which Slavs? Because there are these Slavs here. And then there's these Slavs here, and then there's these Slavs here. Now, which of them? Are they the same? You see, when you take language, it becomes a nonsense. Why not have one state of the United States, Britain, Canada, Australia, New Zealand? It's one state. Because they're all the same. You're going to say, well, they're all the same. How can you say they're the same? But what makes them different? They speak the same language. Well, see, that's the, that's the thing. That nation is a construct. Not that it's not based on certain things that exist, but you have to define, you put some artificial limits on how far you take them. Okay? It's, it's, it's a meeting of different aspects, political, cultural, and so on. Because what else than you know, location and you know, uh, uh, politics actually separates you know, entities like United States and Canada? Why are they two? Um, so, for the Czechs, this was an idea, this was a problem. So the idea of, of Slav, Pan-Slavism, get a uh, grasp hold of, of, of these nationalistic efforts for a while. Pan-Slavism was the idea that all Slavs perhaps should, should, should all consider themselves of part of one family of, of, of you know, Nations of one group, uh, something you know, because they historically they're, they're the Slavic, uh, you know, they weren't always at the top, and perhaps now it's time for them to take ownership of this history. Like all Slavs should be one. It's just like in Africa, you will have later in the 20th century a similar phenomenon with African nationalism, which is absurd because there never has been an African identity as such in Africa. Right? It always has been tribal and regional and local and linguistic and religious. Like not, you know, nobody you would have thought that I'm my identity is African, but there has been an attempt to do that, but it failed. Right? Or uh, 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 you know, so um, Pan-Slavism was such an attempt, but this was countered by Austro-Slavism, and your book talks about uh, the, some of the important actors here. František Palacki, who was a historian who basically, you know, wrote the history of the Czechs, invented the history of the Czechs. Not that he, you know, made it out of the air, but made the narrative. And, uh, and, um, and Palacki, who famously said that if the Austria, Austrian Empire, you meant, would not exist if it would have to be invented. And the reason why he said it would have to be invented is because he was felt the pressure from, well, especially from the Russian part. Because Pan-Slavism was, well, if you take all the Slavs to be, maybe we should, you know, to, to be one, who is the biggest player becomes the Russian. And he, remember, Kundera talking about this danger that Palatsky, even in the 19th century, understood. So the counter ideology was Austro-Slavism, that all those Slavic nations who were within the Habsburg Empire, which is more accurate, not Austrian, but Habsburg, because it wasn't Austrian. Habsburg, meaning the empire run by the Habsburg family, uh, who was the, separately the ruler of all these lands. So maybe all the Slavs in the, in the Habsburg Empire should form one Slavic. That was a bit nice, actually. Rather than pan Slavism with this culture that is quite alien, and these are Orthodox, we are Protestant or Catholic, and, and so on. But that's an also an interesting thing. So in the Czech, uh, case you have both political uh, uh, defined nation with the Landes patriotismus, reflecting, hearkening back to the history of Bohemia, you know, the nobles, the role the nobles played, remember, in Bohemia, 
they were the, the body of the, of the state, but you also have cultural nationalism. This is the time of the famous Czech Renaissance, when history is written and invented again, hilariously first in German, when, when the language is, is, is defined, and when all these institutions like theaters, museums, newspapers, create this common uh, uh, culture. And the role again of the writers, of poets, of playwrights, of, uh, of composers in all these countries will be crucial. And again and again the anthem will be written now and the song is still sung today because all these artistic, remember, because if your identity is cultural, who defines it if not the writers, if not the composers, if not the, those who produce manifestations of this common culture. Um, I will stop the video now and continue with the second part.